Lehman Rus, also known as the Wolf King, was the Primarch of the Sixth Legion of the Legione Astartes, the Space Wolves. Rus was considered to be one of the strongest and most skilled of all the Primarchs, and because of the brutal and fierce nature of both him and his legion, Rus would also become informally known as the Emperor's Executioner. By his own admission, Lehman Rus believed that he could overcome and overpower all but two of his brothers in combat should the opportunity present itself. Those Primarchs that Rus doubted he could defeat in combat were Sanguinius of the Blood Angels, due to the Angels' combination of skill and sheer fury, and Conrad Kurz of the Night Lords, as a result of the Night Haunters' unpredictable insanity. During the events of the Horus Heresy, Lehman Rus and his Legion answered the summons of Rogal Dawn, the Primarch of the Imperial Fist Legion, to travel to Terra in order to reinforce the throne world of the Imperium against the inevitable traitor assault. However, Rus would disagree with Dawn's plan of simply waiting for Horus's forces to come to them, and much to the chagrin of his loyalist brothers Sanguinius, Dawn, and Jagatai Khan, Rus would leave Terra along with his legion in order to launch a surprise assault directly against Horus in an attempt to end the heresy by striking a final, decisive blow. The Space Wolves Legion would travel to the Tresolian subsector, where they would take the Traitor Legions by surprise, and several Space Wolf Legionnaires, along with Lehman Russ himself, would successfully board the flagship of the Sons of Horus Legion, the Vengeful Spirit. Thanks to a series of markings left by a previous boarding action by Malkador's Knights Errant, Russ and his sons would eventually fight their way to Horus's location, before the two Primarchs would engage each other in a violent and bloody duel. Russ would allow Horus to strike him with his Lightning Claw, creating the perfect opening needed for Russ to impale the traitorous Warmaster with Dionysian, the Spear of the Emperor. The spear would inflict a devastating wound, and its energies would begin purging the chaotic corruption from Horus's body. Russ prepared to deliver the killing blow, but for a brief moment, the Wolf King would hesitate, no longer seeing the traitor Warmaster, but instead, his brother. This uncertainty would cost Russ dearly, as Horus would attack once again, severely mauling the Space Wolves Primarch. But before Horus could slay Russ, dozens upon dozens of Space Wolf warriors would rush to their Gene Father's defense, swarming over the Warmaster like insects, allowing Bjorn the Fell Handed and Grimnir Blackblood the time needed to evacuate their Primarch from the Vengeful Spirit. But what if Lehman Russ did not hesitate in delivering the killing blow to Horus? What could have happened if the Warmaster? had been slain by the Emperor's Executioner. One of the more likely outcomes occurring as a result of Horus' death would be that the previously cohesive force of the Traitor Legions would begin to fracture, with various factions and warbands either beginning to follow their own agendas, or possibly even instigating a power struggle in order to determine just who exactly should be the new Warmaster. Many of these possibilities are even hinted at within the novel Slaves to Darkness. For instance, Fulgrim, the Primarch of the Emperor's Children Legion, simply no longer cared about the greater conflict of the Horus Heresy following his ascension to demonhood. Instead, Fulgrim would become somewhat more reclusive, spending more time ruling over his demon world where he could revel in his perverse indulgences alongside his demonic consort, Nakari. Angron, the demon Primarch of the World Eaters, along with the bulk of his legion, would make their way to the world of Deluge, where the legion would slaughter the world's population as a bloody sacrifice to Khorne, the Chaos God of Bloodshed and Murder. The captain of the Eighth Company, Khan the Bloody, would state to Perturabo, that such actions were the only way to prevent Angron from dying, though in reality unbeknownst to the Astartes, this death would simply have been Angron's demonic form being banished back into warp space. 
If it wasn't for the actions of Lorgar and Perturabo, forcing the two demon primarchs back into the proverbial ranks, following Horus's injury at the hands of Lehman Russ, then both Fulgrim and Angron would quite possibly remain content in pursuing their own agendas. If Horus had in fact been slain by Russ, then it's reasonable to assume that the threat poised to the Imperium by both the World Eaters and Emperor's Children Legions could have become greatly reduced. In essence, without Warmaster Horus unifying them towards a singular objective, then these two legions could have quite easily devolved into little more than disorganised, self-serving warbands with goals at odds with the remainder of the Traitor Legion forces, much like they did in the centuries following the aftermath of the Horus Heresy. It's also a distinct possibility that Lorgar, the Primarch of the Wordbearers Legion, would attempt to usurp the position of Warmaster following the death of Horus. As the Horus Heresy progressed, Lorgar would begin to doubt the competence as well as the very motivations of Horus, feeling that Horus's claims of him making the Chaos Gods bow before him would do little more than undermine their goals. To this end, Lorgar would begin to make plans that would see him overthrow Horus and become not only the new Warmaster but the very herald of the Chaos Gods. Lorgar would reveal such information to the Crimson Apostle, Zardu Layak, as detailed with the following quote from the novel Slaves to Darkness. The gods placed a burden upon my soul. Horus is my brother. But what is brotherhood besides the triumph of the primordial truth? Failure cannot be allowed, my son. The gods must triumph, and Horus will not give them victory. Another must take his place, must unite all under the will and majesty of the gods." While Horus himself would violently reprimand Lorgar for his attempted coup when the traitor forces gathered upon Ulanor, if Horus had been slain prior to this, then theoretically there would be little to prevent Lorgar from attempting to seize control over the entirety of the traitor legion forces. Whether Lorgar would be successful in maintaining or even claiming control over the Traitor Legions is another matter entirely. Many of the Primarchs viewed Lorgar with disdain, seeing him as being the weakest of their number, and given this fact, it seems unlikely that many would even choose to follow the orders of the Wordbearer's Primarch outside of his own Gene Sons. Perturabo, the Primarch of the Iron Warriors Legion, was described as being the Grand High Marshal of the Warmaster, effectively establishing him as Horus's second in command. As a result, Horus's death could result in infighting between those who would support Lorgar's religious proclamations to conquer the galaxy in the name of the Ruinous Powers, and Perturabo's right of succession in superseding Horus as Warmaster. This in turn, could lead to the Traitor Legions fracturing or even disbanding altogether, allowing the Emperor's forces not only more time to reinforce Terra with greater numbers, as more Loyalist Legion forces made their way into the Sol system, but perhaps even presenting the Loyalists an opportunity to launch a series of counter-offensives, preemptively beginning the events of the Great Scouring. Incidentally, if Horus had indeed perished, then Perturabo would not have been ordered by Horus's emissary, Argonus the Unscarred, to retrieve the World Eater's Legion in an attempt to muster the Warmaster's forces. This in turn would also mean that Commander Volk of the Iron Warrior's 786th Grand Flight would not have become the first of the Obliterators which occurred when the Iron Warriors Legion travelled to the world of Sarum to ascertain the location of Angron and his Legion, allowing the demon Sarayum to possess the body of Volk, and infecting him with the Obliterator Virus as a result. But ultimately, if Horus met his end at the hands of the Wolf King, then the Horus Heresy would have most likely ended there and then, with events playing out similarly 
to when Horus perished at the hands of the Emperor of Mankind. The Sons of Horus Legion would likely flee into the Eye of Terror with the body of their precious War Master, and entomb it upon the demon world of Malium, and perhaps even begin worshipping it with religious fervour. This could even result in events similar to those of the Legion Wars being played out, where the traitor legions fractured into many separate and self-serving warbands fighting over resources, slaves and territory, assuming that an individual such as Lorgar or Perturabo were not successful in maintaining the unity of the traitor legions under their own rule. But it would not just be the traitor legions who would become affected by the death of Horus, for such events would affect the Imperium as well. If the War Master perished prior to the Siege of Terror, this would result in several major changes. The first of which would be that the Primarch Sanguinius would not have met his end upon the Vengeful Spirit, resulting in his probable survival of the Horus Heresy. If Sanguinius survived the events of the Heresy, then this would also mean that the Battle Brothers of the Blood Angels Legion and their future successor chapters would not become afflicted by the Gene Seed Flaw of the Black Rage, which in itself was a result of the psychic backlash caused by the death cry of Sanguinius. The second most notable difference would be that the Emperor of Mankind would not have become mortally wounded by Horus, and therefore would not have needed to become interred into the life support systems of the Golden Throne. Despite this, the Emperor would still be forced to try and harness its energies in order to prevent the warp tear caused by the Thousand Suns Primarch Magnus the Red from engulfing Terra. But since the Emperor was never placed into a situation where he would have to face Horus in single combat, then this would also mean that Malkador the Sigilite, the Regent of Terra, would have also survived the conflict, for he would not have needed to attempt to harness the Golden Throne in the Emperor's absence, as the act of doing so would result in his death. Because the Emperor had remained alive and never entered into a state of what is effectively undeath, this then means that his authority would not have to be nebulously interpreted by the High Lords of Terra, and thus the Emperor could theoretically still have issued commands and decrees that, in turn, can be followed to the specific standards of the Emperor's expectations. This would also mean that the High Lords of Terra would, at least hypothetically, expend less of their time and energy in jockeying and scheming against one another for power and prestige, as the Emperor would still technically walk amongst mankind, and his authority would be absolute and without question. In addition, since the Emperor was never placed in a position to martyr himself, then this could also mean that the Ecclesiarchy may not even have the opportunity to rise to such a degree of prominence perhaps remaining only as a series of small, outlying religious cults. This in turn would mean that future events that were a result of the Ecclesiarchy's actions, such as the Reign of Blood, would also be less likely to happen. Ultimately, if Rust succeeded in slaying his traitorous brother and struck Horus down when the opportunity presented itself, then perhaps the Imperium could have retained a semblance of its former glory as opposed to the stagnation and irreparable decay that it now suffers from. What do you think? Leave a comment below, and thanks for watching.